Hello and welcome back to Where the Demon Lurks. We will be continuing where we left off, which if you recall is after Kobu was able to bring Morris back from his demonic um, form. He was able to talk him down and bring him down, but Morris right now is resting because he, his soul energy is exhausted. And between him and Lucian, they're taking care of him. Well, I mean, Lucian provided a feather, which is basically like putting him on life support so it takes care of his other bodily needs while he regenerates his soul energy um aside from that not much else has happened there was a conversation between kobu and lucian where kobu basically unloaded on the angel telling him that like even as a demon lord and and the time after, he didn't feel like the Demon Lord, and yes, Lucian is here to bring back the Demon Lord, but um, he doesn't feel that he fits the job, and like as he stands right now, he's he's no Demon Lord. Um, there was a, there was also the discussion of whether or not to tell Morris that he is a demon, and he is the Demon Lord. And Kobu was like, no, 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 like, we, we, we won't do that. And Lu Lucian's like, but he's going to have to find out eventually. I mean, he will, considering how he responds in the other two routes. It probably will be a bit of a shock. But then again, considering the fact that he is half demon, then, you know, glass houses. Um, But yeah. So Kobu is contemplating having to give Morris a bird bath because he, obviously the guy is unconscious so you kind of have to take care of his hygiene so I'm pretty sure that's about to happen anywho so yeah like without further ado let us continue where the demon lurks the next day you return home from work to find Lucian and Toast have left it's just you Morris and the floor mattress you set your bag down next to Morris's briefcase and bring a bowl of warm water and towels to the boar's side. Uh, excuse me, Morris. I have to give you a bath. You wet a towel. The heat of the water causes you to flinch a little. You raise Morris's left hand and begin to wipe him down. You find that he's surprisingly muscular under that chubby exterior. You douse the cloth in the water and wring it before wiping Morris again. Mm. Now that you're done with both arms, you wipe his chest. The feel of his heartbeat beneath the palm of your hand makes you ponder the irony that a demon is caring for a mortal, or at least half a mortal. Showing mercy was something close to impossible for your kind. You expected the same of every mortal. The day mortal kind becomes completely merciful is the day hell freezes over. Then there was Cain. He was always helping, even back then. It had been days since you last left the bizarre dragon-worshipping town. Without a coin to your name, all you could do was trudge to the next red zone. Fear was a common traveling companion through your journey, every shadow concealing a possible attack. The freelancers weren't after you then, but the world was not kind to an aimless stranger. At one point, you had to put on a set of clothes from a random bin to hide your identity. Your old clothes were kept in a black plastic bag that you carried everywhere. Eventually, your travels brought you to Kibbleton. Exhausted and aimless, you stopped at the front of Sunny Fruits. Wanting to get out of the rain, you were scrounging through the rubbish out in front of anything that you could use as cover to keep on going. The plastics are so small. A dented can of soda? Is it safe to drink? Creak. That was when King appeared. He stood at the threshold of the automatic door with the bin bag in one hand and an umbrella in the other. When your eyes met, shame gripped your chest. It was a second nature to run. Wait, sir! You ran, not knowing where, just anywhere, from peering eyes. The rain washed away the blood, and your body naturally healed, though slower than usual since you got to Earth. You hugged yourself, trying to conserve what little warmth you had left in you. The embarrassment of being seen in your state was as painful as the slabs of cold air. Your nails dug into your arms, a flash of Vendrick's scepter looming over your head entered your mind. 
The fur on your back stood on end, as though you could feel the pain of being flung across the room again. Visages of Endrick's fury shook your heart. Why am I still here? So lost you were in your thoughts that you didn't notice the clerk walking up to you. Um, sir? You look up to see the same bright pink pompadour from before. His eyes twinkled with concern. Sir, are you alright? It's not safe to sit here in this weather. I'm King. Well, what's your name? I... Kobu. He smiled when he heard your name. Do you have a home or someone that I can call to bring you back? You shook your head. Well, you can't sit here all night. The security guards won't let you, and you might get sick. King held out his hand to you. Let me help you. Come with me, and let's get you back on your feet. You didn't know then, and you still don't know why. Perhaps you don't care anymore. You could have been left to die there, and then by a stranger, but perhaps you also truly believe that there was hope left for you. You took a warm shower in King's bathroom. It was your first real shower in a long time. King spoke from behind the bathroom door. I dried your clothes that you were wearing. They seemed clean enough, but the clothes in your bag was covered in a lot of dirt, so I had to put it in the wash. You look great, Kobu. Sorry your other clothes aren't done yet. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mr. King. You didn't have to go through the trouble of washing them. It's okay to just throw them out. Just King, and no offense, but I don't think that you can afford to lose more belongings. He was standing over a pan with an omelette cooking in it. Why don't you take a seat in front of the TV? I'm making a mushroom omelette for you. Sorry, but I don't have much meat on hand. I hope that this will do. You don't have to trouble yourself. I'll be out of your hair. Honey, you telling me to stop makes me want to do the opposite. King served the food onto a plate and grabbed a new fork before holding the dish out to you. Take a bite at least. He came off to you as quite pushy. You didn't really need the food, but you thought that it was best to humor him. You took the plate. It had a rolled up slice of scrambled eggs with golden brown mushroomy bits sticking out of the sides. Not expecting much, you took a bite. The omelet was milky and smooth, with the mushrooms adding just the right texture. It was so simple of a dish, and yet you couldn't help but shed some tears. Are you alright? Oh my god, did I mess it up? It was my usual recipe. No, it's fine. It's... I'm sorry. You close your mouth, but the tears that you've held back over the two years of running kept flowing. Thank you. Just thank you. King walked over, put aside your plate of omelets, and hugged you. It's okay. Let it out until you're ready. So you cried until a good few minutes passed. Eventually, he got you to sit down by the TV and finish your meal. He sat across from the coffee table, watching you. The sound of rain serenaded the moment. In between bites, he asked you about your identity. You told him a very edited version of the truth, that you had lost everything after taking over your father's company. What stuck with you the most was the words that you both shared that night that cemented your decision to stay in Kibbleton. What will you do next? Uh, I don't know. Maybe wait out the rain, then make plans to go to the next red I mean the next town. I just want to get as far away as I can from anything that has to do with my past. King rested his head against his right hand. His soulful eyes met yours. Must get pretty lonely, all alone out there. He spoke more softly than before. Yeah, it does sometimes. The way that he kept his eyes on you made you wonder if you are sensing some feelings building in him. He drew circles on the table with his finger, as though he was mulling over something. You recall the times that you used to leave the underworld, to mingle with the mortals, and how many such encounters began similarly. A little indulgence wouldn't hurt. No free lunch, as they say. Especially at night, when you know you could really use some company to feel safer while running from town to town and state to state. Wow, the furthest that I've ever been from Kibbleton is my university in another state. 
You must meet a lot of exciting people during your travels. You lean in close, putting on your most charming smile. I have, but I've never gotten the chance to know them all intimately enough. Never enough time. Makes a man wish that things could be different. You know what I mean. King leans in close still. His eyes were wider than before. Heart beating, you waited with bated breath for the moment your lips met. Then King tossed his hands in the air. With his triumphant gesture came an unexpected declaration. I got it. You can stay here in Kibbleton. You blink twice. Uh, come again? You said it yourself. It's lonely. It's unsafe, and you want to get to know people better. Why not take some time to live here? I've got a spare mattress. Kibbleton is super slow. Nothing really special happens here, and Sunny Fruits is always recruiting. The sheer shock that the conversation wasn't going where you thought it was dazed you. Sunny what? It's the place that I work. Come on, I think someone with your experience running a company and dealing with people would do great. Of course, you'll start off as a clerk, as us, but you might just become something bigger one day. No, 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 no. Wait, I can't just settle here. Then don't call it settling. Call it sheltering yourself from the rain of the bad luck that got you here. At least until you're ready enough to go do what you need to do. I... I, uh, I can do that? I can just put aside all my responsibilities? It's your life, Kobu. It's okay to take a pause and figure yourself out. Figure myself out? What do I want? From then on, you two become fast friends. Under the cause of self-discovery, you believe that you could start anew become someone that you could be proud of and live here amongst the mortals. But that never happened. In the end, he never asked me for anything despite all the things that he did for me. All right, done with washing the upper body. Tell at the ready you set sights for Morris's underwear. Should I? You reach for his waistband with the caution of a bomb diffuser, almost lifting it up before you pull your hand back. Nah, I don't need to. Hmm? Kobu? Ah! I didn't touch anything, I swear! You toss the towel into the air and it lands back in the bowl of water with a loud splat. Morris! Without hesitation, you embrace the board tightly. He doesn't return the hug, and still you feel his head looking around the room. This is... How did I get here? I brought you here. Well, specifically, it was a team effort. Lucien and Tos helped. They kept you in one place while I helped to calm you down. Then you were... You spread your arms wide to depict the width of Morris's demon form. Lucien? The guy from the store, the one dressed like he's on the cover of a romance novel. Wait. Why? I don't know. He thinks it looks good on him. No. Why did you go after that monster? That thing was a rampaging beast. It could have killed you. I... I couldn't just leave. It, it, it was you. Morris shakes his head. That wasn't me. When I transform, I have no control over myself. The last time that I came out, I went berserk, tearing off the monastery. How do you think that I'd feel if I came to and found out that you got hurt or worse? I'd imagine the same way that I'd feel if I let you get hurt, even in that form. Um. You... I mean, it seemed more scared than scary. I just had to talk to him for a bit and he changed back. What? That hasn't happened in years. It usually goes on a rampage for days. You calmed it down? How? You shrug. I have questions about the whole half-demon thing. Mm hmm? Like, when you transform, does all of you get... No. Okay, then what about the more serious questions, like how did all of this happen? N -uh. Zip it. No more questions about it, until I say so. The overwhelmed Morris brushes his head, causing Lucien's feather to flutter into his lap. He picks it up and examines it closely. This isn't a normal feather. Demon magic. No, something different. Morris raises an eyebrow at you. Oh, yeah. Did I tell you that Lucian's also an angel? 
God. Yeah, that's his boss. He closes his eyes and rests the feather against his face. Yeah, um... He's here to find... Someone. He couldn't tell me more. No clues yet, but he's willing to help us... Uh, get King back while looking. Morris raises the palm of his hand to signal you to stop talking. Did you happen to find a briefcase when I returned to normal? Yeah, it's over there. I left your phone on it as well. You point at the briefcase sitting next to your backpack. Let me get dressed and make contact with Gin. So soon? You just woke up. Don't you need rest? I'm fine. It's like I just took a good night's sleep. Huh. Lucian's feather must have done the trick. Uh, I'll take him later. He takes out his phone and punches in his contact's number and sets the phone to speaker mode. In a few seconds, the call connects. Who is this? It's me. Ah, the big bad demon didn't consume the little piggy. What a shame. When I saw your walking ball of dread went away, I had hoped that you and the demon had killed each other. He saw the battle? Does he know about Lucine and Toast? Yeah, you'd like that, wouldn't you? Now cough up the reward. I'll have a courier send the batteries to your office. What about the Underworld Gate? Ah, yes, that. You'll be happy to know that there is an Underworld Gate in Kibbleton, located at the old arcade shop on Doberwalk 1. Doberwalk 1? That's near the old shopping district. Who made that gate? Why, we did, of course. You keep a stoic expression, but deep down, your heart is a whirlwind of fear and anger. What are those creatures planning? How do we get access to it? I doubt it's just sitting there for anyone to use. Hmm. Well, perhaps good old Mr. K could help. If he's still around to receive the keys that make the gate functional. If he's around, where is he going? Didn't you know? The cult is laying siege on Mr. K's manor as we speak. Morris and you look at each other anxiously. It doesn't look so good. The sound of munching comes through the phone speaker. Morris ends the call and turns to the door. Stay here. I gotta make sure Mr. K survives. Hold up. You grab him by the hand. What are you even planning to do? This is a gang war. We don't have any stakes in it. We do. If Mr. K dies, then those keys fall into the hands of someone more powerful than the old codger. This is our best shot. Now stay here. It's safer. No. I get that this is important, but I'm not letting you go alone. Morse wrestles his hand free from your grasp, then grasps you by the shoulders, digging his digits in a little too hard. His snout covers your field of vision. Listen to me. I don't. I can't let you get hurt because of my mistakes. Just let me do this. You can see the desperation in his eyes. Morris, I get it. You're afraid, but we can protect each other. If you turn again, I'll be here to help bring you back. How can you not be scared after seeing what I turned into? Eh, maybe I've been two men who turn into huge beasts, but also I'm not afraid because you'll be with me. Morris snorts and lets go of you. He turns around without saying a word for a good minute. You're going to try and come along even if I say no, aren't you? Eh, I just might. Morris reaches for his briefcase and pulls out a stack of yellow paper slips. He then opens up a tear and stores his briefcase within it. I didn't see you do that before. Hidden spell compartment. Here, try these. You take the blank paper slips. A cold chill runs up your arm and down your spine, like a streak reaching into you. Suddenly, each piece of paper radiates with wild, misshapen soul energy. Those are training talismans that we use with new recruits at the monastery. I've kept those since I was a lad. They work at the cost of your soul energy. Why do your people have these? The monastery uses them to find new candidates for, for one. They only react if you can access soul energy. Try and tear the talisman. If you have enough soul energy to manifest the spell, you could join the monastery. Considering your ability to see the supernatural, I bet there is a good chance that they'll work. Okay. You begin to tug at one of the talismans. Black ink spreads out across the paper from your fingertips. You conceptualize opening a portal to Morris within your mind. Another tug and the paper rips. 
A breath of cool air escapes you as a chunk of your energy drains away. Then a blue portal emerges. One end before you, the other in front of Morris. It worked? Hmm. You might want to consider a job hunting demons. You laugh nervously. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I might. Interesting how your powers manifest. It seems to be made of the element of fire. Morris puts a hand through your portal, pinching your nose on the other side. Ow! The portal closes on its own, and his hand vanishes. It doesn't do any damage, so it's not very useful in the fight, but could be a good way to escape. Dude, you put your hand through it without knowing that? I put my hands in more dubious places. Losing a limb isn't new to me. Anyways, we don't have enough time to study it in detail. How are you feeling? I'm good, just a little tired. Exactly, don't use them recklessly. Just tap into your own soul to manifest the spells and regenerate. You stuff your extra talismans into your pocket. One more thing, you can't fight if you cannot recognize friend from foe. He pulls out a different talisman, this one is blank. A blank piece of paper? This talisman has a copy of the ring's magic on it. They use this to disguise themselves in public. Now hand me your glasses. Like those talismans, they will train you to be attuned to the group's magic. Eventually, you won't need these glasses to see them. You hand your glasses to Morris. He whispers in an incantation onto them. Inscriptions burn into the legs of the glasses before vanishing. Try looking at the talisman with these on now. You put on your glasses and look at the paper he's holding out. An image is clearly visible. A circle and a star inside. I see it. Taking the glasses off, the mark is gone. On, and it reappears. Whoa. This would be so cool if they weren't so dangerous. Yeah, come on. Enough dallying. You nod and call a cab to pick you both up. You got Morris's talismans. Now you will be able to use demonic powers without raising suspicion. You got a pair of enchanted glasses. These will allow you to see through the disguise of mythical creatures and witness their magic. You lost $25. Your wallet will never forgive you. The cab ride from your place takes you up on a hill overlooking all of Kibbleton. Moore sits in silence beside you on the back seat. He's looking outside at the scenery. You grip the hem of your shorts, your heart pounding in your ears as your mind conjures monsters and other oddities awaiting you. I can do this. I have to. We're king. Right before the cab reaches the top of the hill, Morse tells the driver to stop and you both get out. Do you see that? He points to the contour of a dark orb taller than the trees surrounding you. It smells familiar to when Morse turned into a demon, a fuel generated by someone stronger. I see it. Do you know what it is? You feign ignorance. That's a concentrated magic field. Ancient texts in the monastery have recorded high-ranked demons and angels being able to cast them. Mr. K is the first creature that I know who can cast them as well. Inside, all rules of space and time and reality become irrelevant. It's the world of the caster. Your best bet is to avoid it. He's that strong? Is that one over there his? It doesn't look like it. Trust me, when you see his, you'll be swimming with the fishes. Let's hope it doesn't come to that. Your heart beats faster. This Mr. K could be as dangerous as the cult. I wouldn't bet on it. Walking straight ahead and turning a sharp corner, you come upon the entrance to a hilltop mansion. The gate. Beneath your feet lies the busted remnants of the mansion's automated gate. A nearby trail of footsteps leads into the dark orb. Last chance to turn back. I ain't walking all the way back down this hill. Then there's only one way to go. Entering the orb, a sickening miasma lingers in the air. You're standing within the courtyard. The cultists and gang members are brawling in the distance. There's no time to take it all in. Blasts of magic fly through the air. The hooded figures are knocked down, but they keep getting back up. The cultists move slowly as if weighed down by an invisible force, barely reacting to the kicks and punches delivered by their foes. A scream rings out to your right. Four of the cultists grab hold onto a griffin, biting and clawing at his wings and legs. The griffin punches one of their heads, then its head spins in a full circle. It continues trying to shake the cultist off. The cultists continue their assault, 
as though nothing happened to them. Ah, did you see that? Come on. Morris grabs your hand and rushes you into the manor. Inside, you come upon a grand staircase. The foyer's opulence puts your teeny apartment to shame. You'd feel intimidated if it weren't for the ongoing cultist attack. Two mythical creatures lie dead on the floor. Long white bones have protruded from their chests. Blue blood is oozing out of them. More screams can be heard from the rooms to your left and right, people yelling for help. Above you, you heard footsteps and the sound of rushing water. He's upstairs. We... Three white splotches appear at the foyer ceiling, from which a goo slithers out, forming effigies before you. They rise and their forms solidify. They're wearing the cultists' uniforms, but their faces are melting like boiling wax figures. Oddly enough, there are no taller than your knees. Those... those things are not people. Good. Then I can do this. Morris casts a fireball at the creatures, the spell erupting into a pillar of flames. Even as they burn, the cultists make no sound, the intense heat only serving to melt their faces further. The blazed creature runs towards you, far faster than the cultists outside. Run! They're too fast, and one of them leaps up onto your chest. As it grabs onto your shirt, it inflates like a balloon. Kobu! Morse casts the spell of air, sending the other two creatures towards the stairs. You rip a talisman in your pocket, and a small portal emerges right in front of you, and another right above the other two. Quickly, you shove the creature through the portal, its limbs breaking away like twigs. The monster falls through and explodes on the others, sending them flying across the foyer. Good job. You're pretty good with that spell, by the way. Yeah, you can thank video games for that. You both run up the stairs before the creatures can give chase. Morris leads you to the first room at the top of the stairs. The doors barely hang on their hinges, the white paint now stained with blue blood. A pool of water seeps out underneath the threshold of the frame. Salty sea air fills your nostrils. Morris looks at you to confirm your preparedness. You nod back and help to push open the barricaded door. You feel a gust of soul energy, a full wind that blows through your fur like a thunderstorm. As the wind settles to reveal a looming figure with his back turned towards you, he raises a limb that splits into three tentacles, as though signaling to you not to approach. Across from him, a mortal dressed in the cultist garbs is smiling eerily at the looming figure. This cult member's jacket is different from the others. The patch on his arm is completely filled. He carries with him a disturbing confidence. Raising an open hand in your direction, the cult member speaks. Allies of the monster, come to die? How many have you enslaved with your powers, Kraken? No matter. Send as many as you like and I will strike them all down with righteous fury. For I am Prometheus and I will enlighten mortal kind. The cultist narrows his eyes. His smile dips slightly. Your silence betrays you, Kraken. I sense your fears. You see how one man has undone so many of your allies leaving you all alone. You will regret the day that you underestimated our kind, thinking your magic allows you to rule over us. Well, no more. Prometheus's eyes bulge outwards. No use repenting for your sins. Your kingdom has fallen, as shall you, and in its place I shall rebuild heaven on earth. Your chatter doesn't amuse me. You intrude upon my home. Desecrate it with your unnatural magic, kill my companions, and you have the guts to lecture me about sin? You don't understand an iota of what power you yield now. Tell me, how could a dim-witted fool such as yourself be able to obtain this magic? You would never understand. This power is a gift from my loyal and loving followers. They entrusted their souls onto me for our shared dream of a world free from death and your kind's influence. You speak with such conviction. You fooled even yourself. However, like your name, your words are stained with lies. Parasites like you are a dime a dozen, a false savior that is merely puppeteering others to leap off ledges so that you may stand over their corpses. You're nothing special. Never have been. Never will be. This shameless magic field of yours 
is proof of your pathetic need of relevance. I wager you are nothing more than an insignificant nothing, someone the world would never even consider if left alone. You stumble upon this world thinking that makes a chosen individual, but to me, you're just another meal. Silence! You don't know me! I'll make you now to my powers! Wax-like splotches appear across the floor. The zombie cultists slowly emerge from them. Mr. K chuckles. The folly of the young. You think being able to command minions and cause a little chaos means power? Power is the ability to shape your own reality. Absolute power is making it the only reality others abide to. The Kraken clasps his tentacles, forming a circle. Get him! The wave of zombies charge at him. Mr. K raises the circle up to his right eye and exclaims, Yes, one room wide should do. Kobu, hold mine! A blast of soul energy then consumes the entire room. In an instant, you find yourself submerged in water. You panic, kicking about when a pair of hands grabs you by your armpits and drags you up above the surface of the water. Gah! Morris! Morris drags you out onto a beach. Stay calm. We're trapped in Mr. K's attack. Mr. K stands not too far off from both of you. He turns around promptly. Morris, you and your friend better know how to swim. I am not holding back. Shit. Morris helps you up. Stay alert. He's not going to be thinking about our safety. Right. Both of you are on a small, sandy island in the middle of a vast ocean. The pale moonlight illuminates the area around you like a spotlight. This world is not real, merely a pocket dimension that you have had the misfortune of being pulled into. You are awash with feelings of familiarity and fear. Vendrick demonstrated a similar power while you were learning from him, a power that you have yet to grasp. Mr. K moves to the edge of the beach, his eyes trained on his opponent. Morris is standing next to you, watching for an attack to reach. Prometheus uses the bodies of his zombie cultists as a raft in the water. He's keeping his distance from the looming kraken. His summoned cronies from earlier are nowhere to be found. Interesting. I don't remember a beach being here whenever I use this spell. Perhaps the shape of my soul has changed over the years. Reminiscing over your old home, Kraken? Take a good look, because I'm burying you here. The cultist dashes towards Mr. K. Bodies of his minions appear in time with the steps, building a bridge of corpses towards his goal. Suffer! His hands glow white as he summons three magic circles in the air. Corpses launch out like a barrage of missiles towards the mythical creature. Mr. K plants his feet. With the rays of his hands, four massive tentacles the length and width of a telephone pole spring up instantly and take the hit from the flying corpses. The cult leader approaches Mr. K when one of the tentacles swoops down in an attempt to grab him. Prometheus summons a small hill of corpses, lifting him high above the attacking tentacle. The tentacle smacks the corpse hill, and Prometheus squeals with excitement as his minions catch him. You've overstepped. Mr. K's hand glows blue. With the push of his hand, a massive wave rises in front of him, knocking into Prometheus. You expect the cultist to block the attack with his corpses, but he doesn't bother. The wave consumes him whole. Your heart jumps, expecting the fight to be over, but then he flies out of the ocean towards the clouds. He can fly? Suspended in midair, Prometheus laughs maniacally. Struggle all you might. It will all be meaningless soon enough. You cannot kill me. I have conquered death. A tentacle sprouts from beneath Prometheus. The cultist quickly summons a wall of corpses, more than enough to block the attack. All the while, he flies even higher, as though... He's afraid of the tentacles. The cultist's hands glow, and a small white corpse appears around them, each no longer than a foot in size. They writhe around his hands as if affected by some electrical force. They move faster and faster, a dark orb of energy forming within Prometheus' grasp. Enough games. He tosses the ball from Mr. K, who forms a bubble of water around himself. The moment the energy ball hits a massive explosion, it ignites the sky. Have some more! He gives a Kraken 
no chance to counter, summoning another ball of energy and throwing it again and again at Mr. K's barrier. The third hit breaks a portion of Mr. K's bubble before he can close the exposed area another energy ball explodes. Mr. K screams in agony. A knees courses through your body. We need to do something. You got a plan? I have a hunch. We need to distract that cultist and get Mr. K to end it with one of his tentacles. You would think that if you need to distract the cultist that you should teleport Morris to Prometheus. But that's not what you should do. Protect Mr. K. You'll see the moment when Mr. K needs the attack. Go! You use one of your talismans to conjure a portal beside the Kraken's barrier. Morris rushes through the portal and in front of him and reappears at Mr. K's side. Mr. K! What are you doing, boy? Prometheus fires another blast at the board. You counter by throwing forth a portal right in front of the blast and redirecting it back at the cultist. The attack hits a wall of corpses, but it still sends Prometheus back a good meter. He's avoiding your tentacles. I can see that. Then we just need to make it so that he can't avoid them anymore. And your little friend is willing to be the distraction? Mr. K undoes his defenses. The head drips with blue blood. You have a better idea? Ha! Prometheus regains his bearings. His eyes lock onto you. You can sense the rage building within him. Let's see you dodge this. Prometheus nose dives towards you with an energy ball charged up. Launch the harpoons! His right hand darkens with black ink that forms into the symbols of an unknown language. The water beside you glows red hot. Five harpoons fire out like missiles targeting upon the cultist's heart. Prometheus halts his descent and redirects his blast at the harpoons midair. The two attacks clash against one another, neither giving way. Mr. K's right hand burns from the ink on it. The cultist prepares another blast of energy within his right hand. Morris fires two massive fireballs at him from the enemy's right hand side, one staggered behind the other. I see your trick. Don't underestimate me with something so simple. He switches the spell to his right hand. Prometheus summons a wall of corpses to block. The first fireball explodes upon making contact with the wall. Prometheus laughs maniacally. You seize the moment to rip out another talisman. We, Huh? The second fireball enters the portal, re-emerging directly above the cultist's head. The fireball erupts into a pillar of fire, like a sun burning above the gloomy sea. The flames consume the cultist's entire body. Mr. K's attack is completely blocked by the foe's final energy ball, but it doesn't matter anymore. Prometheus's unconscious body hangs in midair. Finish it now! Mr. K snaps his fingers. The island rumbles. All eight of the Kraken's tentacles rise from the ocean, quadruple the size that they were before, each capable of towering over a double-story building. The tentacles entangle around Prometheus, two binding each limb. The cultist shrieks as he comes to. No! 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 He summons corpses again. They latch onto the tentacles and explode madly, a last-ditch effort to try to free him in vain. This wasn't supposed to happen! I, I did everything right! No! The tentacles pull away in opposite directions, ripping the mortal asunder. His remains are dragged into the depths of the sea. It's done. The roaring ocean rises, signaling the closure of the Kraken's imaginary world. In an instant, everything is swallowed into the blanket of white mist, and you are returned to the office room from before. You are standing before Mr. K with Morris to his right. You look around in a daze. A black leather jacket suddenly falls from the ceiling onto your lap. Accompanying its descent is a blue flame. It floats towards you, seemingly drawn to your presence. Within the flicker of its flames, images of a child give way to a somber-looking adult, then to the cultist that you saw before. You feel it calling out to you, a wish for you to know its life. The soul. Mr. K's shadow darkens your vision. He's looming above you. He grabs the soul and unceremoniously drops it into his waiting maw. The fur on your back stands on end. Everything seems to move in slow motion as the soul falls into his mouth and is swallowed whole. After a satisfied burp, Mr. K's eyes fall onto you. Let's talk, kiddo. To be continued. 
Thanks for playing the latest update. If you want to let us know how we're doing, leave a rating and a comment on our Itch.io page. We want to hear from you. Where the Demon Lurks is supported by those who sponsor us on Patreon. Consider supporting us so that we can make the game bigger and better. Or you can support us by buying our merch, available from the fine folks at Popprint Press. And if you want to be kept up to date on the development, feel free to follow our Twitter or join our Discord. Ah. Oh my god. So, that was pretty good. Um, I like the whole little moment that Kobu and Morris were having. Well, Kobu and Demon Morris were having. That was pretty good. Um, I kind of like that the beginning part with uh, King was a little different from what I remember. I like the fact that technically, if you think about it, um, in this update, or in this route, I guess, uh, King seems to be getting maybe not close, but maybe a bit more friendly with Amari. And in... Was it Toast Route, I think? Or Lucian? One of the other two. I, I think it might have just been both of them. He's, um... Nox was more interested in King. Like, he, he had more of a interest interest with him. Um, I'm wondering if later on it's gonna be like, oh, and depending on each route uh, that you're playing, that one of the three demon generals is gonna be helping king because they get closer or more familiar with them or something i don't know anyways um so yeah uh what else what else what else because i'm trying to summarize the whole like two hours that i literally just read it's probably gonna be a little less than that when i edit it but still uh what else what else what else what else mm. i kind of like this uh, this update a bit more because I kind of feel that a little bit more care was taken with trying to establish the characters, maybe their motives and things like that, a little bit more, so that they feel a bit more fleshed out. Because even in this one, Lucian, um, like you can see, like, yes, this is a job for him. He's trying to do this so that he can, you know, get head pats from Gary. But at the same time, it's also he feels that he needs to do good because otherwise. You know, what's his purpose? What, what was the whole point of coming to to the mortal realm to do this if apparently the demon lord doesn't exist anymore or he doesn't want to exist anymore. He just wants to be this like normal little human. Well, not human. This normal little mortal who just wants to work at a convenience store. Um, And then, what well, well, Toast, not so... No, no more... Uh, character development happened, but he did speak Spanish, so yay! Libra, listen to me. Um, because I I told them that like make Toast speak more Spanish, please. I, I want to speak Spanish. Quiero hablar más, quiero hablar más español, por favor. Um, what else? Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? I am interested to see what this mythical creature has in store for these guys, or at least for um, Morris and Kobu. Also, the the cultists were the ones that um, kidnapped the Archon, right? In Toast's route. So I'm wondering if how Prometheus got the powers if it involves him doing something to the Archon. So, you, you know, we'll, we'll see, I guess. Mm, I believe the next update is Lucian. So, oh, also the CG. Um, is it on here? This one. So the CG. So I like the fact that, you know, that they're including CGs now because they, they have a... A very they were lacking a lot of cgs let's put it that way there was a lot of scenes that could probably you know if they're able to pay for them you know include a cg or two 
to show what's happening. Um, but yeah. Oh, the, the whole like little interaction between Kobu and King where, you know, he was recounting how they first met and how Kobu arrived in Gibbleton. That was actually kind of cool. That, like that you were getting like this backstory information that, you know, kind of is needed. A lot of visual novels, and this is something that I was discussing with one of my friends, that a lot of visual novels sometimes struggle with trying to give you information in order to try to flesh out the world, try to flesh out the characters, and sometimes they just do like like info dumps where it's like within one update you you learn everything there is to know about one world, but sometimes other visual novels don't really do that much world building, and so you're left with going like, well, we're in this random place with these random people that we just met and things are happening. And sometimes that actually kind of works because it's like, you know, you you build a world around them based on what's happening. But sometimes it's like, we, we kind of need just a little bit of information. And other times when they give you too much information, it's like, okay, you're giving me way too much and it's making it very hard for me to, you know, um, you know, to keep track of what's going on. There's a helicopter flying over my house right now. It's very loud and it actually made the window shake a little. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it in the recording. Anyways, but, um, you know, back to uh, Kobu and Morris. It's nice. Um, this was needed. I, I don't just mean the CG. I mean them getting, like, close like this. I'm assuming, of course, Morris not knowing that Kobu is the demon lord or is... knows about demons, like, this intimately, that he's a little weirded out that Kobu is like, oh, you know... I, I, I don't mind it. Like, I, I seem worse. And Morris is like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? I mean, isn't he scared? Um, he's probably not used to somebody not being scared of him turning into a demon. You know. Um, what What is that name that they use in, in Inuyasha? Uh, when there's like when they're half demons, it, is it Hanyo? Uh, uh, what is that word? Hold on, I'm googling. But yeah, Hanyo. That <laughs> technically Morris is a Hanyo. 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 A half demon. Um. But unlike Inuyasha, where. Inuyasha is already a half demon and you know he has full access to his half demonness. Um Morris is a mortal who under certain circumstances turns into his demony self. So yeah. He's still a Hanyo. Anyways, so actually talking about um uh, Morris, and I'm probably gonna end up talking about this before when I split the this recording into two episodes. Um his little field, number I can already hear somebody say, oh, his domain, his expanded domain. Um, you know how people sort of turned into like black, like shadows that you can just pass through? I wonder if he's doing that on purpose so that he doesn't hurt anybody. Basically making it so if somebody is within his, um, his field of influence, that he can't physically hurt them. Like he could probably like tear apart a building, but he can't actually physically hurt um, somebody because they're literally just a shadow. He can't, you know, he could probably like swat at them, but nothing will happen to them. Sort of like how Kobo literally ran through somebody and nothing happened to them. And then as soon as they walk out of his uh, sphere of influence, they're just back to normal, like as nothing happened. So I wonder if unconsciously, knowing how dangerous he can be he made it so that anybody that happens to be within his sphere of influence doesn't get hurt by him directly so yeah it's another thing that like that was popping into my mind as it was happening or after it happened i guess um so i wonder what this mr k this mr i was gonna call him mr Krabs, but it's like mr kraken um i wonder what he's about to you know do, say, show, or whatever, you know, to Kobu. 
Anyway, so yeah. Write down in the comments what you think, and thank you all for watching slash listening. If you would like to play Where the Demon Lurks yourself, you can do so by going down into the link in the description, which should have a direct link for their Twitter page, and I don't know if they have a Blue Sky page, but if they do, I will be linking that down. And as they said, they have a Patreon, so if you would like to support the project and maybe, you know, make it more financially available for them to be able to include more CGs, because let's, like, let's face it, one of the highlights of this whole update is the CGs. Like, come on, look, I have it right here for a reason. Um, so, you know, subscribe to their Patreon. You know, you can do like the lowest tier. You don't always have to do the highest tiers, but like, I'm pretty sure they appreciate any support that you give them, including, you know, writing positive remarks on their Ichio page, rating them highly. Um, and yeah, you know, Oh, did I forget that, you know, the Twitter and possibly Blue Sky pages have direct links to the Itch.io page where you can download the game and play it, or you can just go to Itch.io and download it yourself? Anyway, so yeah, um, I guess that's it for now, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye bye